morning, everybody. Sorry that I couldn't be at the meeting this morning, but Dr. Christensen and Laura asked me to go over uh, medications in chest pain patients. Um, just reviewing some things that probably everybody knows, but making sure that we're staying up to date um, and able to do the best that we can for the patients that we're taking care of. Um, I'll try to keep this quick because I know Dr. Ragoso and Angelica have presentations on cases coming up, um, but I'm looking forward to hearing. And also because if I make this too long, there's no way I'll be able to get it sent to Laura. Um, chest pain patients, uh, a few medications we want to go over to make sure everybody um, is up to date and confident to give these medicines. Um, the first thing that Dr. Christian wanted me to touch on is aspirin. Everyone knows that when you have a patient with chest pain, you're going to give them aspirin. Um, one thing that's important to remember with that is oftentimes patients may say that they take aspirin um, on a regular basis. Most of the patients that we take care of are only going to be taking one baby aspirin if they do take one every day. So they still have room for more or they may normally take it, but they didn't take it that day. Um, or if they took some prior to arrival, how many did they take? Um, in most cases, you're going to be safe to at least give a patient two baby aspirins, 162 milligrams, um, to try and make sure that they have that in their system. Of course, we know that a standard dose with a patient with chest pain is four baby aspirin, 324 milligrams. Um, but definitely consider talking with your provider. And if it's a patient who says they take it, and maybe they took one at home or maybe they took two or we're not sure, definitely consider giving that patient two um, 81 milligram aspirin while they're in the urgent care with that chest pain complaint. Remember that um, it's really important medicine. We give it so often that sometimes it kind of gets overlooked as just being simple and it's just something we do for everybody regardless. Um, that aspirin will act as a platelet aggregate. Um, it's going to help to prevent further clot formation in that patient um, that could be having a heart attack. Um, and that can be extremely important for them, especially for patients that we're taking care of because if you're having chest pain and you're truly having a heart attack and you're in emergency, you're a long, long ways from the cardiac cath lab, which is what that patient needs the most. So anything that we can do to help them um, prevent any further clot formations or any other complications while they're having chest pain becomes paramount to their you know success and survival ultimately. Um, next medicine we want to talk about a little bit is nitroglycerin. We know just like we've done a hundred times we can give um, three sublingual nitros to patients with chest pain um, one tab under their tongue every five minutes so long as their blood pressure systolic stays up over 90 um, or their pain resolves. Um, if they get three sublingual nitro and their pain is still there, um, they have EKG changes and the provider feels it's warranted, then it may become necessary to start that patient on an IV infusion of nitroglycerin. Um, if we need to go over that some more, please let me know. Um, I'll refer back like I have in the past to the video that Mike did on the pumps that we have currently in the urgent care um, for you to be able to set that up and run that at the rate that you need to. Remember that nitroglycerin is given in micrograms per minute. It's not a weight-based infusion. Um, you can anticipate that an IV infusion of nitroglycerin will be started at 10 micrograms a minute if it's for a patient that has persistent chest pain. If it's a patient that has a true STEMI um, infarction that your provider is trying to care for, then you can anticipate uh, 20 micrograms per minute um, and or maybe even more. Um, <clears throat> in patients that have CHS exacer CHF exacerbation, you could see a 50 microgram per minute um, infusion rate. And remember that the infusion range for IV nitro is 10 micrograms per minute to 200 micrograms per minute, which is a huge range. Um, sometimes 
I think just because possibly we don't give IV nitro as often as other medications, it can be a little bit daunting and people get nervous about it. Um, as long as the patient has, you know, adequate blood pressure, um, if that's what's going on with them, then it's safe and could be extremely important for them to have that. Your heart is causing that pain and hurting you because you're not getting adequate perfusion to the tissue of your heart. Your heart needs oxygen and it wants it. And that nitroglycerin is going to dilate those coronary arteries to help provide more blood flow to that tissue, hopefully providing the oxygen that it needs. And that nitroglycerin is exactly, that's what it's designed to do is to help dilate those coronary arteries and get that perfusion to your heart. Um, we give the sublingual nitros, no big deal. And it seems like no one has any concerns about doing that. Just remember that a sublingual nitroglycerin is 0 0.4 milligrams or 400 micrograms. And so we'll give 400 micrograms at a time, no big deal, or 1200 micrograms sublingually in 15 minutes and really not bad an eye at it as long as their blood pressure is good. But then if you're starting an IV infusion of nitro at, um, I think even at 20 micrograms a minute, it's only like 600 micrograms an hour. So you're still way less than what you're giving sublingually. Yes, it's IV, it's probably faster acting, but it's not anything to be super concerned about so long as the patient's status you know, your exam, your foot repeat assessments with the patient and their blood pressure are fine, and then you're still in a good spot and you're doing what's best for the patient. It's not something to be too worried about necessarily as long as you're following within those parameters. The other thing with IV Nitro to keep in mind is if you do have a patient that is um, suffering from an inferior wall MI, which would be ST elevation depression or specifically Morse case is elevation and leads 2, 3, and ADF. That would you know designate that you have a patient that has an inferior wall MI. You want to be cautious about using nitro in that patient. They may not have adequate preload to be able to sustain having that nitro in their system. Um, and it could cause their blood pressure just to tank really bad. It doesn't mean that a patient with inferior MI can't have nitro. You might want to consider with your provider giving you know, IV fluid therapy to that patient. If their volume is, is adequate enough, then they may be able to have nitro to help with their chest pain. Um, but it's just something to keep in mind that if you look at their EKG and you see that elevation in 2, 3, and ADF, you want to consult with the provider before you go too much further with that and make sure that you don't bottom out that patient's blood pressure. And of course, don't forget if your patient has um, had a dose of ED medication within 24 hours or 72 hours for others, then that could contraindicate the use of nitroglycerin in that patient if that's the case. Um, I think that's most of the things I want to cover about nitro. Uh, trying to keep moving on this so I can keep this short and sweet. Uh, oxygen, make sure that any patient that you have, that you have, you're taking care of with chest pain, you're giving them oxygen. Remember, their heart wants oxygen, so give them some oxygen in their nose. It's not gonna hurt anything. Try to provide that with them. You're, it's not gonna hurt, it's only gonna help. Um, fentanyl or morphine. If you have a patient with chest pain, you give them aspirin, You've drawn their labs, you did their EKG, you gave them a couple sublingual nitros, they're still hurting pretty bad. You're considering putting them on a nitro drip, talking to the provider. It could be very warranted to give that patient a dose of morphine or fentanyl. Um, and in, all I can go off is of my experience and patients that I've taken care of that are having active MIs, if they're really, really hurting bad, it seems like a lot of times if you give them a good dose of IV pain medicine, it kind of brings their pain down to a little bit better level. That nitro starts to get in their system better and hopefully you can find a balance there to keep them comfortable, um, their vital signs stable, um, and keep them feeling better and on their way to where they need to be ultimately uh, in the cath lab. So something to consider. Remember, you know, dependent on what your provider feels like, 
fentanyl or morphine um, could be super helpful for, for that patient and their comfort and treatment as well. Um, heparin. Most times uh, what we'll see depends on what the provider um, discusses with the receiving facility. Um, sometimes if you're like me, you may encourage the provider just to give a weight-based dose of Lovenox because it's one injection in their abdomen and then you're done and you can just inform the receiving facility that they've already been given Lovenox. Um, but it seems like here recently, quite often the providers um, who are accepting the patients that we send places with chest pain are asking for the patient to be started on heparin. If the patient is asked to be started on heparin, we do have heparin uh, pre-loaded um, uh, bags. We have IV bags with heparin in the urgent care as well as vials. Um, we have 5,000 unit vials and the bags of IV heparin as well. Common use that you'll see and you can anticipate with heparin is a 5,000 unit bolus or one vial if you want to do it that way. Um, oh, and then an infusion somewhere between 10 to 15 units per kilo per hour. Um, not too difficult to bath, get that figured out and be able to start your infusion and have that going for your patient as they get prepared to go um, to the cath lab. Once again, you know, if that's what the provider and the receiving facility determine is, you know, best uh, treatment for your patient, you know, getting that done is what can help them the best because they're a long ways from a cardiologist if they're at the urgent care um, and anything that we can do can help. So anticipate, you know, most likely a 5,000 unit bolus, you can either give that out of the bag just as a bolus through your IV or you can draw that up and then give that as a push dose and then start your infusion immediately right after 10 to 15 units per kilo per hour is what you can anticipate with that. Um, and just informing everybody along the way that that's, that's what you have started. Um, T and case. We have T and case in the urgent care. It's important that all of us are familiar with how to use that. It's really pretty straightforward. If by chance you have not had the opportunity to use it, you can open the box and look at it. The directions are right inside of the box when you open it up. There's two vials, one's dry, one's wet. You, there's needles and a syringe in the box. You draw up the fluid, you mix it with the dry solution, with the dry components, and then voila, you have tea in case. It's a weight-based medication. There's a chart on the inside of the box to help you know how much you need to give. Um, and it's pretty straightforward. It gives you the volume of what you need and what the dose is, and then you confirm that with your provider and you can give that to the patient. Things that are important to remember with tea in case is the directions are inside the box. It's very expensive. Um, I need to confirm with Lori Dalton and Laura where we buy our tea in case from. If it is a medication that perhaps we're buying from Mount Graham, which I know sometimes we do. Um, if for some reason, well, as a general rule, you do not want to mix. You can open the box, but don't mix the tea in case unless you're 100% sure that you're going to give that to the patient. That the provider has talked to the patient and confirmed with the patient they want to take it, that they understand the risks and benefits of taking tea in case. And when you know that that's for certain, then mix the medication, get it ready and give it to the patient. Um, just because your provider tells you we're gonna give tea in case, that's great, get the box out, have it ready, but make sure they're gonna give it 100%. If for some reason you happen to mix the medication and then the doctor hadn't talked to the patient or the patient changes their mind or who knows what happens, if that gets mixed, don't throw it away. Um, that's why I need to talk to Lori and Laura about um, there is a chance that depending on where we purchase that from, if it does get mixed, we can return it for a partial refund because it is so expensive. So if for some reason you mix it and don't use it, please do not throw it away. Let Lori, <clears throat> let Lori and Laura know um, and we'll see if that's something that's possible for us and I will get back to everybody on that to see if that's the case. But as a rule for now, don't throw that away if for some reason it gets mixed. Um, 
look over my notes here real fast. I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover. Last thing that I would encourage you to think about when it comes to patients with chest pain, if the patient's troponin is positive, if they have EKG changes, if the provider has determined that the best case scenario for this patient is they need to be transported out of town. Um, if you're transferring a patient um, with chest pain out of town, the transport crew, especially if it's AirVac or LifeNet, even Sunrise, whomever, especially if it is a STEMI patient, they're trained and told to keep the downtime to a minimum. So don't be surprised if the AirVac crew shows up and they're in a hurry and they want to get the patient onto their stretcher on their uh, monitor and their pumps and get out of there as fast as they can. I know that we can be shorthanded at times and there's only so many of us. If at all possible, you want to try to have everything ready for them before they get there um, so that if it is that case and they show up and they're ready to go and they want to leave right now, we can do everything that we can to not um, delay in that patient's transport and getting them to the cath lab as fast as, pass as, fast as possible. Um, quick review over some of the medicines that we're going to see and use in chest pain patients. Um, hopefully it was helpful for you. If you have any questions, feel free to send me those on Teams. Uh, I'll be happy to answer them or find an answer for you if I don't have it. Um, as always, if there's something that you have a question or concern about um, or you'd like to hear about in any of these meetings or us to have just a quick video meeting over, please let me know. Um, things in the future that I'm looking at trying to do and talking with Dr. Christensen and Laura about um, next month in April, we're planning to schedule a splint class, um, especially for the techs and, and the nurses too. And we would like, it's not going to do a whole lot of good to watch a video on splints. We need people to be there in person. If you have a preference on when we hold that class, uh, it could even be like on a Saturday morning. I can work Friday night and stay on Saturday so we could have the class. Please let me know because I want as many people as there as possible uh, to meet with Tracy and I, and, uh, Laura, and make sure that everyone feels comfortable um, applying splints. The other thing that I'm hoping to try to work on, I need to talk to Dr. Christensen about some more, is the possibility of getting some pig bones or some sort of bone um, from a lab that we can use to practice IO insertions on. Um, there's been quite a few questions about IOs. Dr. Christensen would like us to feel more confident and, com and be competent in the use of IO needles. Um, and the only way, like we talked about before, to really get good at that and feel more confident is you have to do it. And Marina is the only person I know who's waiting in line to get one, which I don't feel comfortable with. Um, so if we can get something to practice on, um, that's something I'm looking into and trying to make possible. Um, just to let you guys know some things that we're looking at. So if there's anything else that you have that you would be interested in, please let me know. Thank you so much for your time. Enjoy the rest of the meeting and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.